مرغ باغ ملکوتم مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت اند از بدنم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب يسر وأعين يا كريم وافتح بالحق إنك الفتاح العليم The believer is the one who knows his coordinates So I thought that it would be uh, helpful so that we breathe the local atmosphere which is a, a deep and perfumed and complex atmosphere here more uh, successfully and uh, nutritionally if we considered a little bit about the significance of the city of, of Konya, why is it that we're here, um, what should we be thinking of here, how can we relate what we find here to our reality in a place in the 21st century West that seems so totally disconnected from uh, the far away, almost unimaginable dream time of the Seldrics of Rome or the Seldrics of Iconium. Uh, no doubt you already know a little bit about it. It's a very ancient place uh, near here, Chatalhuyuk. There's one of the oldest cities, some would say the oldest city in the world, uh, <coughs> maybe seven, eight thousand years old, and already clearly a religious center. Uh, the Hittite period, Alexander the Great defeats Darius of Persia, and this becomes part of the Seleucid, that is to say, the Hellenized Persian Empire. And then uh, the Romans come, uh, and then it becomes part of that hugely important contested zone between the Eastern and the Western civilizational spheres. Of course, there was never a, an iron curtain, but one of Konya's many significances and one of the things that we need to think about when we're here, when we consider the forms of religiosity which it has hosted and indeed produced and exported East and West, uh, we need to think about one of the things that Islam has done in history that has in fact seldom been accomplished. When you think of the ancient struggles between Greek civilization, the uh, putative ancestor or source of modern Western civilization, Plato and Aristotle, Aristotle himself, the tutor of Alexander the Great, uh, and the Eastern world, the world of Persia and then India to which it was closely related and beyond, you see that this is probably the most significant cultural fault line in history, running roughly along the valley of the Euphrates and then further north till it comes through Asia Minor, one of the great civilizational uh, nexus points of, of human history. Probably no boundary has been more significant and has done more to shape the specific outworkings of our civilization. Alexander the Great crashed through here and defeated the Persians and brought the, customer, customer, uh, the culture of the West, uh, the medicine as well as the physics and the metaphysics and the logic of Aristotle to the Persian world. And then uh, when he died, died of course at the age that many of you are now, uh, the interaction between the Persian world with the Indian world and even the Chinese world that was beyond it and the Western world of which places like Iconium were amongst the most easterly boundaries uh, becomes one of the great constants of, of human history. And even the ancient Greeks were very aware of it. One of the things that Athens was always afraid of was subversion of its own state by the Persians, uh, but also 
the cultural contamination of the proto-narrative of Western civilization by Persia. The Eastern Mediterranean, particularly in the Greek context, represented the one, not really the Abrahamic one, the personal god of Semitic revelation, but the one of Plato. All of existence is an emanation from one principle, which Plato called the good. And against that, further to the east, points east of, of here in Iconium, there was an essentially dualistic world, the world of the Iranian plateau, where there were two gods, Ahura Mazda and Ahriman, a god of good and of light and a god of wickedness and of darkness. And from this flow so many of the great arguments that then, when the Muslims appear on the scene, become axioms in Islamic civilization. Let's think about it. Think about the history that this particular borderland represents. <coughs> Alexander the Great manages to unite the Eastern Mediterranean with the land of the two deities to the east. And enormous transformations ensue in terms of the Eastern movement of Western philosophy and medicine. And also in terms of the Western movement of Eastern traditions including dualistic heresies, including Persian religions like Mithraism. Why is it that if you go to Hadrian's Wall, the city was once dedicated to the Emperor Hadrian, but the Roman Empire was far flung. Hadrian's Wall, there are temples of Mithras. There were people who went as far as the boundaries of Scotland with these Persian religions, Mithras temples unearthed recently in excavations for a new bank in the city of London. Persian religion was significant. And then you have the Roman interregnum, and then in the seventh century, Alexander's conquests are, as it were, repeated, and many of the consequences um, are repeated as well. So the only two conquests in history which have united the Eastern Mediterranean world and the Persian world, with places like Iconium as their symbolic borderland, are Alexander the Great, and um, al Khulafa al-Rashidun. Nobody else has ever done that. Even the Ottomans tried, but they couldn't really occupy Persia. And the Persians under the Safavids and subsequently tried to invade further west, but they were defeated by uh, uh, Sultan Selim and so forth. They couldn't manage it. But Alexander the Great did it. Maybe this is one of the meanings of Dhul Qarnayn. Qarn is like a generation or a world, uh, a people and he united these two worlds. And also, uh, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, also replicated this. So one of the great stories of our civilization is how the one, this time in its Abrahamic manifestation, moves to the east and very dramatically to the east, so that by the 16th century, people are studying Plotinus in Sumatra. Uh, and also how Eastern traditions move towards the West, and uh, the whole tradition of Zandaka in early Islamic civilization is to do with the uh, internalization in an often quasi-illegal form of Persian types of religion in the Abbasid elite, and that becomes a significant issue for the ulama, people who are superficially Islamized and, as it were, Abrahamized, but deep down, there are these dualistic ideas. And this becomes a recurrent theme in early Islamic civilization. But the point is that where Alexander failed, because dualism survived in uh, the Iranian uh, hinterland, uh, Islam succeeded uh, as one of the myriad accomplishments of, of, of the blessed early generations. So this is a very significant uh, borderland, and as you would expect, has been the crossroads of all kinds of important ideas in the history of Islam. You can't really understand, certainly the second half of Islamic history, unless you know what made the city such an extraordinary and a unique crossroads of ideas. After all, if you think about it, in one city, you've got one of the greatest Kalam scholars, you've got Ibn Arabi, you've got Jalal ad-Din Rumi, you've got Sadr ad-Din Qunoy. Everybody is here, as it were, in that, that extraordinary 13th century which is in many ways the watershed between an older Islam and the Islam that then became Ottoman Islam and the Mughal Islam and the Islam that, that, that we inherit today. Vastly important. So let's try and think about what is happening 
in that contested zone between these two worlds, albeit the eastern zone has, of course, been uh, uh, Islamized. But the old philosophy is still alive because whereas the Byzantines had suppressed the philosophical schools, the Emperor Justinian closed down uh, the last Greek philosophical academy in, in Athens in the sixth century, the Muslims didn't. And in fact, the Muslims did the opposite of what the Byzantines did because the Khalifa and Matmon created a great institution whose sole purpose was to en enable Muslims who read Arabic to engage with the culture of Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, and the Greek heritage to see what was of benefit for the Ummah of Islam. And one of the great accomplishments of our civilization has been the way in which the best of the ancients were incorporated and everything that was irreducibly pagan or irreconcilable or not properly theistic was rejected. A process that took hundreds of years but was ultimately successful. So we have this uh, extraordinary receptivity of our civilization to all of those uh, older and in many ways troubling traditions. Part of the greatness of Islam is not that it is syncretistic, because evidently it is not. The scripture is always sovereign over any possible development or interpretation, but rather that it uh, is able to find what the Holy Prophet ﷺ called Dalatul Mu'min, the lost riding beast of the believer, and to make use of it, and if necessary, even to go to war on it. So that Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, is able to defeat the subversion of a certain type of Ibn Sina metaphysics by using its own language, something that the exoteric ulama or the ulama who didn't understand the philosopher were not able to do. So he charges into battle, as it were, on the, the horse of Aristotle himself and succeeds and carries the day. And this is one of the most uh, important aspects of our culture to understand, particularly for Muslims living in the West who wonder whether the Islam West engagement is simply about either or, or whether there can be a, a mobilization, <coughs> a domestication of the instruments of, of the other. Islamic civilization has always, at its highest moments, been aware that, of course, you can learn from the other, you can benefit from the other. Logic, which you're studying here on this uh, rihla, is something that has, has its roots in uh, Aristotle, uh, but was something that was domesticated in our civilization and became absolutely indispensable in the adumbration of the fiqh as well as the kalam. That is part of what it is to be a Muslim. It means to learn from others rather than to close one's eyes in a state of panic when you see something different. So to return to the story of, of Qunya, why is the 13th century such a key point in the history of our civilization? Without the city and that concatenation of different human types and minds, the Islam that we live today would be very, very different. It seems to be off the beaten track. It's in one of these new Muslim territories. This was not Abbasid country, even though uh, some of the Abbasid Khulafa engaged in Ghazwa near here. Even Sayyidina Muawiyah, some of the Sahaba encamped near here on their way to besiege Constantinople. But it was part of the Byzantine land until the great battle of, of, of Malazgirt at the end of the 11th century when the Byzantines were shattered by the Turks and uh, the uplands of Asia Minor uh, were open to uh, Muslim settlement. The reason why all of these people are ending up in, in, in Khunya is basically because that was a, a troubled age, an age of fear, if you like. Islam's own war on terror, to use a discrepant uh, metaphor. And the terror in their case was the terror of the, the Mongols, a Tatar. Khunya is filling up with refugees and refugees from Khorasan, one of the greatest provinces, the most intellectually important regions of the Islamic world, uh, is being overrun by the marauding Buddhist shamanist uh, Mongols who are literally destroying everything in their path. So uh, Rumi, as you probably already know is, know, is not born here, but was born in Balkh, which is now a small place in northern Afghanistan. But was, when he was a child, a city of over 100,000 people, a prospering center of Islamic commerce and of intellectuality. Uh, and at the age of 12, he left never to return 
uh, because his father, Baha Adin Walad, who is one of the great jurists and khatibs of, of the city, uh, who has the great Kitab al Ma'arif, which um, has been done into some European languages and is an extraordinary treasure trove of, of Islamic wisdom, saw, as it were, the clouds of dust on the eastern horizon and had the resources, like many people, to move away from Balkh and indeed. He was wise because shortly after he left, the city was destroyed. And according to the chroniclers, at, at any rate, uh, out of the 100,000, there were only uh, about two or three dozen survivors. People had managed to hide in various places in the city while the uh, Mongols uh, burnt and raped and pillaged and basically destroyed the entire city. And Belch hasn't really recovered to this day. If you kill everybody, it's hard to revive a city. Many of those places, um, Khwarazm, for instance, on the coasts of the Aral Sea, it was never really repopulated and has never recovered. So this is an incredible catastrophe and it killed tens of millions of people. And those who got out while they could left and arrived here essentially as refugees. Uh, so there's uh, what Konya represents really, and its inner spirituality represents people who are coming from Khorasan. As you go into the, the, the Mazar, now the museum of Jalaluddin Rumi, on the right hand side you see some smaller graves, uh, which are the graves of the Khorasan Erleri. That is to say that the men of Khorasan, or those who arrive from Khorasan, Aramek means to arrive, and they are coming uh, with that first great um, exodus of, of, of dervishes, people of wisdom, people of knowledge coming from the east. In fact, there's even a story uh, which some grandmothers in Konya will still repeat, which explains how the city of Konya got its name. Of course, it comes from the old Roman name Iconium, uh, which Sultan Mesod, I think it was, in the 13th century, turned into, into Konya. Uh, that the story is that two of these dervishes are actually deciding to take a shortcut in their exodus from Khorasan, so they're flying on their carpets. And they're flying over this rather nice area with agriculture and lakes, and lakes near here, and, and trees, and one of them <coughs> says to the other, Konalimme, which means, shall we land? And the other one says in a kind of folk Turkish, Konya, okay, let's land. So allegedly the city got its name from the dervish that said, yes, I'm going to land my flying carpet. It's a, a kind of folk memory of how the city acquired uh, the depth of its Islam. This is a Khorasani uh, Islam. Not necessarily just a Hanafi Islam. There's a strong Shafi'i uh, tradition here, Shamsi Tabriz, who's Rumi's muse, friend, master, whatever, is actually uh, Shafi'i. Um, so this is where the city's roots are, not just uh, the people who come to make up uh, the Mevlevi tradition, but also a lot of Naqshbandis uh, and others coming from, from the east. Uh, and there's also people who are coming from the Iranian uplands, who are forming part of the world uh, which gave us uh, Maulana. One of them, for instance, uh, who is mentioned quite frequently in the great book that we have about the scholars and Sufis of, of 13th century Konya, which is a book called Manaqib al-Arifin by um, Aflaki, who was writing, I guess, just under a century after Mevlana's lifetime, and which is uh, an amazing treasure trove of stories, legends, uh, information, dates about, about this extraordinary time, was Sirajuddin Urmavi. Now, you look in vain, as far as I know, in the streets of Konya for a, a, a grave for him. I don't think anybody knows where it is, but he was certainly one of the key figures. And we might as well, you know, inshallah, recite a fatiha over his name because he was one of the great figures here. He was the Qadi uh, and was from Urmia, which is, um, Lake Urmia is a, is, a, is a lake in western Iran. And he was part of this, this westward drift into this new territory of Islam. Islam is shrinking in the east but moving into new territories, kind of wild west of Islam, uh, as the Byzantines are uh, retiring and castles are being taken one after the other. The Muslims are moving steadily towards Constantinople. Uh, Sirajuddin Urmawi is a very well-known uh, uh, faqih and also uh, a Kalam scholar, best known for his um, his uh, Kalam commentaries, but also he has uh, an important book, uh, Al Arba'in which is on a set of what he took to be the 40 most difficult masail uh, 
um, in the uh, Usuluddin of uh, Imam Fakhruddin Razi. So he's basically a Kalam scholar and he is uh, a faqih. <coughs> and he becomes appointed to be Qadi al Qudat after having been in the other of the great Seljuk Islamic cities in central Anatolia, which is a place called Sivas, which is uh, somewhat to the I guess to the northeast of here, but where there are some really amazing monuments from that time, the Guk Medrese, uh, the, the sky or heaven madrasa in Sivas. Much of it still survives, and it's one of the most beautiful buildings in the whole history of Islamic architecture. It's well worth, well worth checking out. So he becomes a teacher there, and he becomes Qadi of Sivas, and then he comes to Konya, and he uh, associates with, with uh, Maulana, and one of the things we have to get straight when we think about that world and all of these huge people who are rubbing shoulders with, uh, with each other, very rare in Islamic civilization where so many extraordinary sort of leading figures are actually together in what was probably then quite a small kind of uh, a town, uh, is his particular relationship to uh, Maulana and to some of the other figures. And we'll have cause to uh, encounter him uh, uh, sub subsequently. Um, so Sirajuddin Ulmawi is, is here and is part of, of Rumi's world. Uh, another important figure, and if you're going to understand the intellectual history of Islam, you have to know a bit about him, uh, Sadruddin Qunavi. He's called Qunavi because this is where he's from. Uh, Sadruddin uh, is a little uh, mysterious in a certain way because uh, Sadruddin is particularly connected to Ibn Arabi's tradition. And just think about it. The greatest poet Islam has ever produced, Jalaluddin Rumi, is from here. At the same time, the most influential metaphysician, probably, whether you like all his ideas or not, but it's uh, Mohideen Sheikh al-Akbar, Ibn Arabi, is also here in the same town. He's a bit earlier. Uh, Ibn Arabi dies in 1240. Maulana Jalaluddin dies in 1273. Uh, but still, they're here in, in the same town. And Sadr al-Din Qunawi is um, the closest disciple and, as it were, the heir and legatee of Ibn Arabi. Uh, and that makes him really important. And he's particularly relevant in that it's here in this city that Qunawi is putting together his commentary on the Fusus al-Hikam of Ibn Arabi, uh, and also his uh, tafsir, I'ajaz al-Bayan, which is uh, in the Iranian madrasas to this way, um, taught as, uh, as an important uh, text, looking at some of the most complex metaphysical questions that are raised in our civilization, but with reference to um, Quranic inspirations. One of the things about Ibn Arabi is that he focuses, and William Chittick in his recent books has focused on this, focuses on quite a literal interpretation of, of the Quran. So Ibn Arabi is here, and he's from way out, not from the Mongol frontier, but from the other frontier of Islam, Muslim Spain, which is being lost to the Crusaders, Seville, his native town, destroyed in his lifetime. He ends up here. Uh, and uh, is developing this very Qur'an-focused type of metaphysic. So Sirajuddin Ormawi is the Qadi, and he's really into the Kalam appropriation of Ibn Sina. Ibn Arabi certainly knows his Kalam and knows his Ibn Sina, but he's not really primarily interested in that way of explaining Tawheed to a sophisticated generation. Of course, the masses, the guy selling falafel on the street corner doesn't need any of this. He's just a simple believer. But people with ideas, with inquiring minds, they need to have these things spelt out for them, which is why we need logic and we need metaphysics. So Ibn Arabi is coming from a completely different world. Muslim Spain, where okay, you have a few philosophers, but basically it's, it's the Zahiris and the Malikis. And Ibn Arabi is, is a Zahiri. So he's here with his Zahiri fiqh. Um, teaching and teaching the, the ruler in, in, in Konya. Uh, but his ideas, as everybody knows, are really hard to understand and really easy to misunderstand. That's why it's said of Ibn Arabi that nobody in Islamic civilization has been more respected by people who have read his books and nobody has been more hated by people who have not read his books. Which is why most of the scholars today will say, you don't need to involve yourself with these controversies because <laughs> You know, you just need to learn how to do your wudok correctly and how to you know, sort out your own situation. Don't get involved in the extraordinarily sophisticated uh, questions, the subtlety, the lot of, of that type of discourse. 
people come into Islam that way Qunya still has a long reach. We have an Ibn Arabi society in England and Qunya's works are slowly being interpreted and translated. It brings people into Islam, but for most of us it's not useful stuff to read. And generally you will find the sheikhs saying, give him the benefit of the doubt, but you don't need to get into that stuff. This is important particularly for new Muslims because very often with that kind of Western determination to climb Mount Everest, not because the view is better, I guess, Maybe it isn't, but because it's there. The Western desire to climb the highest mountains and to go down to see the vents at the bottom of the sea, to go to the moon. Uh, we, as soon as we become Muslim, we say, who is the most difficult metaphysician in our hist history? And so as soon as we've mastered wudu, we want to open the futuhat and makiyah and become, yeah. Uh, that's really not permissible. And that most of that is from ego. And it's very dangerous. And those books are not going to open themselves up to people who begin either with hatred and envy or who begin with um, self-love and a sense that, well, he's the Sheikh al-Akbar, so let me see if I can sort of master his system. This is all nafs and converts in particular in the Western tradition of the last hundred years have often fallen into that trap. In any case, these are the people who are here and Sadr al-Din Qunawi uh, seems to have been kind of adopted into Ibn Arabi's entourage or household here as a boy and is very close to him uh, and is the person who uh, really becomes what we would nowadays call his literary executor. If a novelist or historian nowadays dies, in his will usually he would say, and I appoint as my literary executive professor Blinkinsop of Aberdeen University, who then becomes the custodian of the books and makes sure that the editions are correct. And Sadr al-Din Qunawi has that very significant and huge responsibility. So uh, these, these key works, his tafsir in particular, his kitab al-Fukuk, his commentary on the Fusus al-Hikam, become the way in which the Ummah subsequently almost always read uh, the books of Ibn Arabi. And it's important if we want to at least take a a peep into that tradition that we do so with a teacher who is following Qunwe's tradition because Qunwe then goes on to become the teacher of a whole lineage that goes on through Dawud al-Qaysari who becomes the first Ottoman Alim and Mudarris and Qadi uh, and then uh, Mullah Fenari who's the first Ottoman Sheikh al-Islam all of these people are writing commentaries on the Fusus al-Hikam the Ottoman tradition is absolutely focused on scholars who are Fusus al-Hikam commentators and that all comes from the tradition of, uh, of Qunawi uh, Qunawi is interesting when you consider our, our traditional stereotypes. All of the tourist guides here will tell you, oh, Mevlana Jalal al-Din, he was a Sufi. And normally we'd interpret somebody like Qunawi as a kind of philosopher, really. And when he's taught in the Iranian houses or madrasa, it tends to be in the context of a certain peripatetic Aristotelian take on, uh, on Islam. But in fact, if you look at Aflaki again, who I think preserves quite well the memory of how the people of, of Qunya remembered uh, these men. There are some strange incidents in which generally Rumi is not taken to be a Sufi. So there's one incident where uh, the Pervane, who's the, like the vizier of the Seljuk Sultan, who's in Mongol vassalage, but the Pervane is somebody who's close to these scholars. He studied hadith with... Uh, Urmawi, uh, he's very close to, to Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. Uh, and a lot of these encounters between these great minds happen in the court or the diwan or the majlis of this Mu'ayyadin Parvane, who's a very sophisticated, uh, cultivated person who loves ideas. Uh, that one of Parvane's assistants uh, dies and everybody is at a kind of aza or um, uh, constellation awake uh, and it's time for the Maghrib prayer, and all the people say, oh, it has to be Mawlana Jalal al-Din. And uh, Rumi uh, declines, and it's very interesting to see what he says. Um, according to Aflaki, he says, Ma mardomi abdalim beharjai ke bashad minashinim vemichizim. We are the abdal. 
uh, wherever we are, we sit or we rise. One of his characteristic enigmatic statements, but he's saying he doesn't want to lead the prayer. Uh, so he indicates instead that uh, Sadr al-Din Qunawi should lead the ulama in prayer at this uh, event. And he says, Imam Atira Erbabi Tasawwuf wa Tamakkun Layar And. He is one of the people of Tasawwuf and Tamakkun. And the uh, dignity of leading the prayer at such an event should be with such a person. Uh, and quite often, in fact, we find this, this bifurcation in the memory of the people of Konya at the time. The Rumi is not a Sufi. He's one of the Abdal. If you're going to understand him and understand his poetry and the impact that he has on the later Islamic world, and indeed on people who are reading him now, including uh, thousands of New Age followers in the West, you have to understand what it means for Rumi not to be a Sufi. Uh, what these people are saying is that a Sufi is somebody who is engaged in uh, complex, uh, systematic metaphysics. That's what the ulama of Konya would understand Tasawwuf to be. So Qunawi, absolutely that. He takes the often virtually incomprehensible, enormous weight of Ibn Arabi's teachings and he kind of makes it comprehensible, makes it into a system. And probably but for Qunawi and the work that he did here, not many people in the later Ummah would have heard of Ibn Arabi because it's really hard to understand and you turn a page and you get the exact opposite of the thing that he said on the page before and sometimes that's deliberate. It's very hard, hard heavy going. Qunawi turns it into a system, particularly the tradition of the Fusus, which as I've said becomes <coughs> axiomatic and it's like the intellectual spine of the Ottoman ulama system and also in the, the Mughal Empire and further east. Qunawi is the one who's, who's doing that. So he's a Sufi, but Rumi is in this world, and Rumi describes himself as Abdal, Ma Mardume Abdalim. What in 13th, 14th century would the Abdal have been? Well, it's obviously derived ultimately from those hadiths, which are sound hadiths, which indicate that there will be a class of awliya who are uh, Abdal, that is the substitutionary saints, often regarded as being 40. And it's always a constant number. If one of them dies, another is, as it were, appointed to the vacancy. And most of them are hidden. And it's through their du'a that creation is sustained. And, and this is a, um, a standard feature of traditional Sufi hagiology. But that doesn't seem to be what Mevlana is implying here. The Abdal in that world of Seldrick Anatolia seems to have meant something a bit different. Uh, there were a lot of people wandering around, usually mendicants, calling themselves Abdal. Um, and even Europeans who travel in this region at the time, mostly Italians, remark on well, the strange individuals with odd behavior revered by the masses and the peasantry in particular, being known as the Abdal. Uh, what it seems to mean is somebody whose access to the divine is not mediated by years of very elaborate study of metaphysics uh, and whose articulation of his system is ecstatic and impressionistic rather than rigorous. Certainly, if you look at Qunawi's work and Rumi's work and you put them side by side, it's like they're from different universes. Qunawi is extremely precise, difficult, demanding. Uh, in his tafsir in particular, everything is rigorously worked out from first principles and he arm wrestles you into the conclusion. Rumi does none of that. He's not really interested in these akliyat, these intellectual sciences. He's interested in uh, the path of love, rahi ashq. He's not linear, he is, as it were, circular and the circle is the symbol of love in our civilization it's this, it's the the moving beyond the stripping away of any earthly thing like uh, intellectuality even once you're in the hajj or the mi'raj there's circles there's spheres aflak it represents uh, the path of of love of ecstasy and the turning that the dervishes do usually for the tourists is a kind of reflection of that even though in the Mevlevi tradition particularly at the beginning it was a very impromptu um, thing rather than the ceremonial uh, thing that it became 
later on. So if we're going to understand Rumi in that world, and obviously the ulama really revere and love him because they're all saying, you're the one who should lead the prayer at this official function, he's declining because he doesn't really feel that he is from that world. He is not from the world of institutional religion, either of highfalutin Sufi metaphysics to get into, that seeks to get in Ibn Arabi's tradition into the very heart of the Qur'an rather than the surface of the Qur'an, Neither is he from the world of Sirajuddin Urmawi, where everything is you know, worked out by logical principles that are ultimately Aristotelian and are there originally to refute Mu'tazila and others. Uh, instead, he's from a different kind of universe, which is this universe of love. And when we talk about some of the other people that he encountered, um, we'll see how significant that is, but still Sadratin Qunawi, just because he's engaged in these extremely intricate reflections on Allah's book and writing these meticulously crafted commentaries on Ibn Arabi's most difficult cruxes of metaphysics, doesn't shouldn't allow us to be distracted from the fact that all of these people were exoteric scholars. Uh, and in fact, Sadruddin, we call him Sadruddin Qunawi, but it seems that the most common title for him at the time was Malik al Muhaddithin. So if you look at Aflaki, who's mainly interested in Rumi's tradition, the Arifin, basically the, the, the Mevlavi uh, tradition, you'll see that uh, what he's really doing, his daytime job, as it were, is his, his uh, hadith classes. He is the greatest hadith scholar of uh, Qunya of the day, and that is how he's generally known. Um, the, so you have these three different human types. You have the Qadi, the Mutakallim, uh, who is Sirajuddin Urmawi, the man of Aql. Islam to be defended has to be defended through the absolutely strongest interpretation that, you, the reason, that reason can supply. And then you have Sadruddin Qunawi, who says, actually the source and the wellspring of knowledge in Islam is the Qur'an, which is Ibn Arabi's insight, and that everything should come from opening one's heart to the isharat, the inner meanings of, of the Qur'an, using quite literal zahiri method that Ibn Arabi appropriates. But still, rigorously put together, systematic theosophy, if you like. And then Rumi, his type of religion is really different as well. But what's bringing them together is the fact that they're all part of the orthodox class of ulama, because Rumi has been giving the khutbas at the uh, Ala ad-Din mosque, the main mosque in Qunya, and he has the white turban of the, the scholar. He's also uh, an expert in hadith, mutabahir, really learned in the uh, intellectual disciplines of, of his time. They're all from the class of ulama. So any idea that we have that these are kind of dusty, weird guys with funny headgear sort of disrupting uh, what the ulama take to be um, the, the reality of Islam, it's not like that. These are people for whom the inward life and the outward life are complementary. But it's not always the same kind of complementarity. Sirajuddin Ulmawi is mainly a person of Zahir, but is a great lover and respecter of the Sufis, as we see from the, um, the Manaqib al-Arifin. Al uh, Sadruddin Qunawi and Rumi, the funny thing about them, even though they're almost exact contemporaries, they're both born in the same year, 1207. Rumi dies in 1273, and Qunawi dies in 1274, so that's a pretty close fit, and they're in the same city. But neither of them in any of their books, as far as I know, refer to each other. Mm, it's strange. So there was, they were on different voltages. They had respect, no doubt, and Aflaki brings that out. Aflaki, of course, is trying to uh, magnify the greatness of Maulana. He's writing Hagiography hey a century later, and he often brings them together in these various set-piece encounters. But still it is interesting that in this town where people are coming together, sometimes they don't have much choice, they've all been invited to a banquet at the palace, they, they all know each other, they're part of this group of ulama. 
that Ronoui and Rumi never seem to talk about each other in their books. And that, again, has to be left as a kind of mystery, but perhaps not quite a mystery, because they do have different, different paths. So when Rumi, as he often does in his poetry, says, uh, put down the text of theology and pick up the flagon of love, the kind of trope that he, he uses frequently. Um, or, by the time intellect has saddled its camel for the Hajj, love has already circled the Kaaba. He says the real way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the heart, through love, through affectivity. That, that's, for him, the prophetic way. That's the way of Habibullah, alayhi salam, not logic or all of this other stuff or profound meditations on different layers in Allah's book. It's, it's love, spontaneity. For Rumi, that's what uh, religion is about. And perhaps that's one reason why in our generation, certainly in the West, Rumi is the one who's been tweezered out of this extraordinary constellation of brilliant minds in Konya, and he's the one who the New Age people like because everybody thinks to th likes to think that they know about love. And everybody likes to use love as an excuse not to perform certain duties or as an excuse not to read too many complex books of theology. It's a, a, an attractive excuse. But this is not really what, what's going on with these people. Uh, Rumi is not saying that the path of the mind, that's Ormawi's path, or the path of systematic Sufi metaphysics, which is the way of the Sufis, like uh, Sadr al-Din, are wrong. Instead, he's saying, that's not my way, and I am something else. Now, what was this something else? Uh, how, how does he become, he's clearly within the class of ulama. He's not a controversial figure, even though he says things that sometimes seem outrageous. Nowadays, if you said half of the things that he says in his diwan, you'd be chucked out of your average masjid, but that doesn't happen with the Qadi and the great scholars of, of the day, because they, they hear him. But what makes Rumi Rumi is an encounter with a remarkable man who is the fourth of the, well, the many people one could talk about, in fact. I haven't mentioned Fakhreddin Iraqi, who is um, living in the same house as um, Sadreddin Qunawi, along with uh, a number of other uh, quite extraordinary people, Mu'ayyaduddin Jandi, huge names, particularly in the evolution of, of Persian literature. Fakhreddin Iraqi, uh, through his Lama'at and other texts, uh, conveys the essence, as he takes it, of Ibn Arabi's system, mediated in large measure through the lens of uh, Qunawi to the Persian-speaking world. And from the Persian-speaking world, it spreads very quickly to the Indian world and becomes you know, the famous controversies at the time of Akbar and Aurangzeb. All of that comes from what's happening in the house that Qunawi and, 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 and Jandi and uh, Farghani um, are sharing um, in, in a suburb of, of Qunya. But uh, none of these people have that effect on Rumi. So Rumi uh, has left his own town, Balkh, at the age of 12. And they end up here, which they hoped was a safe distance from the uh, marauding uh, Buddhist terrorists of the Mongols. And uh, the Seljuks were kind of tough warriors, Turks, soldiers, spent much of their time on horseback pulling impossibly stiff bows. They were tough guys, the Seljuks. After all, these are the people who've defeated the Byzantines. So if you're a peripatetic scholar, you kind of figure out that a place like Konya is pretty safe because um, this guy, the Paravane, Sultan Alaeddin Kaykubad, uh, these are people who are not pussycats. They're going to put up a fight. Uh, the Rumi is here and is an exoteric scholar and teaches hadith and teaches kalam and he knows that and he is really again mutabahir and is respected on that level by these great people here in Qoni and has many students of his own. Uh, and as we'll see later on, it's because of what happens between Rumi and Shams that the students, why does he have students already because, and why do they love him so much? Because of what he was before. And before Shams turns up, he is in the hands spiritually of another strange, mysterious people, person called Burhan ad-Din Muhaqir Tirmidhi, 
Now, as Tiramidhi, his name suggests, he's also from what's now Uzbekistan. He's from the east, but he's a more enigmatic Sufi type, a wanderer. Uh, but the key moment in Rumi's career is when he moves from Tiramidhi's tutelage into this very strange uh, relationship that he has with Shamsi Tabriz. Now, again, the tourist guides here will tell you, the Ministry of Tourism will sometimes tell you, any New Age guff about the religion of love will tell you that what Shams is, is an antinomian figure. That's the kind of standard narrative. And even some of the Orientalists, like Nicholson, have adopted this view. That Rumi is this orthodox doctor of the law doing incredibly boring things with the divine attributes. And then Shams comes along as a kind of hippie with a flower straight from Woodstock, and immediately they will start rocking and rolling, and that's why we Westerners like Rumi. Mm, hold on here, because we actually know what Shams was about, because we have his book, Maralat, which has been studied by a number of Western scholars uh, recently, and which is an amazing powerhouse, visionary text, which shows that actually this guy wasn't uh, a hippie, antinomian, kind of sharia light dervish, but in fact was a good deal more serious than that. And it's very unlikely that somebody as orthodox and straight as Rumi in this orthodox, straight Sunni city like Qunya could have been immediately sort of waylaid into a new age cult. Um, that, that really doesn't happen. These people are disciplined and trained to recognize truth from error. So who was Shamsi Tabriz? And incidentally, the adab, if you're in Qunya, is to visit, first of all, the maqam of Shamsi Tabriz. We don't, probably not really buried there, but his, there's a tomb for him in Khoi, which is over the border in Iran, on the road to Tabriz. We don't really know where he is. Uh, and then you go to visit Mevlana. Uh, Sh Shams is bringing in not the style of Khorasan, but the style of Tabriz. And again, to understand how Islam is moving at that time, you have to think about that part of the world that nowadays we don't think much about, which is basically Azerbaijan and the area down to Lake Ormia, Sirajuddin Ormia, uh, Orma, where he is also from there. Shams is the other great figure from that area who's turning up. And that area is very important uh, in terms of uh, Tasawwuf. So Tabriz is the city where Imam Ghazali's brother, Ahmed Ghazali, fetched up, much more poetic, ecstatic type of, of person. It's the city of Abu Najib as sohrawardi one of the authors of the great texts of, of, of Sunni Tasawwuf. It's the city for a while of um, Hazrat uh, Najmuddin Kubra, his in Tabriz. Uh, it's said that at the time of Shams's youth, there were 70 awliya, zahirin, you know, ma manifest saints in the city of Tabriz. So it's an incredible place. And behind it, you have the mountains of the Caucasus, where all kinds of extraordinary people are there studying, going into retreat. The Khalwatis basically are coming from the Caucasus. Ibrahim Gulsheni, a little bit later, who kind of sets Cairo on fire in the early 16th century. Very controversial figure uh, with his amazing diwan is from what's now Nogorno Karabakh, which is in those mountainous areas just north of Tabriz. It's really uh, uh, a lively, living place. And it's very ancient in Islam. Um, just a month ago in Cambridge, we had a, de a delegation of ulama from Azerbaijan. They have a madrasa there. And they say, whenever people visit us, they say, how long have you been Muslims? And they say, actually, it was Omar ibn al-Khattab who converted us to Islam. So we've been Muslim for you know, a long time. And it's still a very deep place. And these traditions, alhamdulillah, are surfacing after the sort of dead years of communist suffocation. And... But Tabriz is kind of on the, the edge of that, that world. It is in, uh, in, in the larger uh, province of Azerbaijan. Shamsi Tabriz is from there, and we know that he's a chef, uh, and he teaches uh, uh, chef fiqh. Um, he is an expert in the um, uh, Kitab al-Tanbih of Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi and teaches a number of other important uh, Shafi'i texts. Uh, he's also, it turns out, uh, and again, it's difficult with Shams because he, he doesn't write systematic texts on any of these things. He has his maqalat, and you can see sometimes where he chooses to refer to a hadith or a mas'ala in kalam, 
He knows it all. Uh, but he's, uh, he's hidden, Mastur, unlike many of the manifest scholars of, of Tabriz. Uh, he keeps it quiet. Um, it seems that he's alienated from his father, uh, even though he's a scholar of the sacred law. Um, he hangs out with one of the more scandalous individuals of Tabriz called Piri Salabaf. Salabaf means something like a basket maker fairly low caste type of profession, who is known as an ecstatic type. And it may be that the thing that you saw at the maqam of Maulana with the so-called whirling, Debran doesn't really mean whirling, it means turning, ultimately comes from this Piri Salibaf, because it was known that when he went into an ecstatic state, he was always in a state of du'a, he was famous as a man of du'a, he felt so close to Allah that sometimes he would stand and he would turn as an expression of his love and ecstasy. In Persian culture, that's something you do when you're wrapped from yourself in ecstasy, you stand and you turn. So it seems to have come from him. Uh, Shams then leaves the city of Tabriz and goes on his wanderings, which are occasionally described in his maqalat. He goes to Baghdad, it seems he goes to Syria, he goes to Erzincan, which is now in eastern Turkey, he goes to Sivas, he goes to all of these places. Uh, and his curious in that this isn't the standard type of Sufi siyahat or wandering because he doesn't go to the Sufi lodges, the khanaqahs, where any Sufi can get board and lodging for free. Uh, instead, even though he's traveling on a mission, he stays at the kind of sort of the, the holiday inn of the day, a place where merchants would stay, a caravanserai and just kind of pretend to be a merchant. And he even carried with him one of his few possessions was an enormous padlock, which he would put on his door at night in the caravan size, so everybody would assume he was a merchant. In fact, all he had inside was his rush prayer mat. That's all he had on his journeys. Um, and he was one uh, of the, 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 the awliya who refused to accept any kind of gift. So it's not the kind of stereotype of the wandering uh, dervish with the begging bowl. Uh, instead, he's pretending to be a merchant. Uh, and when he needs money, he works as a laborer, um, where he can get work because he's quite sick and, and skinny and sometimes he's not accepted. But that's the work he does. And also as a teacher of Qur'an, he uh, allegedly had a method um, which he'd learned from Piri Salabaf, whereby he could teach the hefs of the entire Qur'an in just three months to somebody who came with the right intention. Uh, and so sometimes he would be, be paid for this as, as a teacher. And it seems that he does this for a number of years, with a halal income, but he has various dreams, and he, re he repeats some of them in the, the maqalat. And one thing that we are looking for in this uh, individual is the sign of what we would nowadays call a tariqa affiliation. Hmm. Is Salibaf really his sheikh? Or was there another sheikh who he doesn't mention? Or what's going on here? Is he a khalwati, qadri, etc., etc.? Well, he says too many people take pride in chit chat about their silsilas. And then he narrates a dream that he had of the Holy Prophet, وسلم, in which he confers upon him a khirqa, a robe of initiation, and tells him to teach. So his understanding is that he is getting it directly from the Holy Prophet وسلم, and that Allah's grace is not limited to particular structures, but that um, he is authorized to teach and to summon people to Allah because of this true dream that he has had. And he's often described in the tradition as an oasis. When we get into the, the bit from the Masnavi that I've selected, inshallah, I might talk a little bit about oasilik, that is to say, the people who are the spiritual heirs of Oasil al Qarni, the famous Sahabi of the Yemen, who was spoken of and praised by the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went to Medina but arrived after the Prophet had died, but still regarded as being in a silsila. No contact, no bay'ah, ijaza, isnad, but still this connection. This is called the oasi tradition in Islam, and it's regarded as an exceptional rather than a normal thing, something that is bestowed and that cannot realistically be sought. If you seek sacred knowledge, you go to the teachers and you jump through the hoops of fire that they hold up for you, and inshallah you'll then get authorized. Uh, these things 
are to do with divine bestowal. This is Wahhabi. Allah can just give somebody a dream and authorize him to do a particular thing, and that, that's it. And there have been a few cases where this is evident in our civilization. But interesting, because it's important from Mevlana, because again it suggests that his teacher is from outside this conventional world of the laying on of hands and an apostolic succession. He has these dreams in which he sees the man who he, say, who, who he is told will be the uh, opener of the door to his qibla. Uh, and he comes to Konya um, in the year 1244. And according to Aflaki, at any rate, he's already around 60 at this time. So he's been on the road for a long time. Uh, and he comes to Konya and he stays in one of these caravanserai inn establishments just outside the town. And Rumi, by this time well-known figure, is passing on his mule with his uh, disciples. And then the moment happens, one of the most important, transformative, mysterious, edgy moments in the history of, of Islam, where Shams sees Rumi and some kind of alchemy begins. And Shams stands up and walks over to Rumi and grabs the bridle of his mule and says, O oh, you who knows Allah's most beautiful names, tell me the answer to this. And Rumi says, what is your question? And he says in a loud voice, who is greater, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or Bayazid Bistami, who's one of these ecstatic saints. Now, in Konya, at the time where people know the Islam, that's an outrageous question. That is exactly the question that you expect from some dusty, illiterate dervish with no knowledge of fiqh. And that's often how this event is portrayed. And Rumi, we're told, hears something in this and faints. And then he comes around and he takes uh, Shams back to his house. And he then gives Shams the answer. He sees what the question really means. In other words, is he going to get off his mule and hit him on the head for being a dumb heretic? Everybody knows who's better. Instead, he takes him back to his house and he says, uh, what you mean is that Muhammad وسلم, says one thing, and Bayezid says another. And what Muhammad says is, Subhanaka ma ariftuka haqqa ma arifatik. Subhanak, ya Allah, I have not known you with your true knowledge. But Bayezid says in one of his ecstatic moments, Subhani ma a'zama shatni. One of these outrageous, not to be repeated, shatahat. In a state of drunkenness, Allah is speaking through him and he repeats, it's like a hadith kursi, glory to me. So on the, uh, on the surface of it, these two texts seem to suggest you know, Bayezid's superiority, but that can't be. And Rumi finally sees what the question is. And he says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is superior because he knew that beyond every knowledge, there is more knowledge, oceans and oceans of knowledge. And he was in the state of suluk, or of undergone, traveling. Bayezid drank just one ocean from, just one drop from the ocean of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and went into this ecstatic state. And then Shams looked at Rumi, Rumi looked at Shams, and uh, other words passed between them, which are not recorded. But then this extraordinary relationship takes place, which I would like to conclude with this thought is significant for us. Because this is not a Sheikh Murid type of relationship. Uh, Shams is not Rumi's Sheikh, and Rumi is not Shams's Sheikh. This is not ijaza, silsila, isnad, anything like that. This is something else, a kind of spiritual friendship. And they've passed through this fire of the outrageous, blasphemous question in order to reach the reality, which is that it's Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the leader of the caravansarai of the people of truth, and everybody else is trudging along behind them. Qafile salari ma fakhri jihan Mustafast. The caravan, our caravan leader is Muhammad Mustafa, pride of the world. And Rumi's poetry subsequently becomes absolutely packed with, with prophetic Muhammadan devotion and imagery. Uh, and then 
something happens between them that makes Rumi Rumi. And of course, you know the story two years later, Shemps disappears, probably because Rumi's disciples, who don't like this weird transformation and this funny guy from Tabriz who's monopolizing their teacher's time, um, make life impossible for him. So he goes off to Damascus. Rumi is inconsolable, in tears, goes off, finds him in Damascus, brings him back to Konya a second time. He disappears, according to some accounts. Some of Rumi's students even kill him. Um, some accounts he just leaves and because he can't take the, the, the pressure. We don't really know. Uh, but in any case, what is important is this moment, this, this catalytic moment, which uh, unleashes this wellspring of creative, ecstatic poetry from Rumi, which makes him the greatest poet of Islam and makes him now, as you all know, the best-selling poet in the United States. There's an irony, despite the war on terror, the one that they most like to curl up with on the long winter evenings is a Muslim poet from Afghanistan. <laughs> Nobody's told them that, but that's his capacity to overcome everything. Even the contemporary clash of civilizations, he just steps over that. Why? Because his voice transforms everybody. Uh, and this is from that moment, from that encounter, from that strange, outrageous, blasphemous question, this emerges. But it's not Sheikh Murid, something else. Shams is like a, a muse. There's a kind of alchemy in their souls uh, that uh, makes Rumi into this hand-clapping lover, but always a lover of the law. Uh, this is something that we know. Man bandai Qur'anam, eger jani daram, man khaki rahi muhammadi muhtaram. I am the slave of the Qur'an for as long as I draw breath. I am dust under the feet of Muhammad, the chosen one. This is, this is Rumi. He's a servant of, of Islam, servant of the Sharia. He's not antinomian at all. Never mind what the uh, Deepak Chopra and Madonna and the others are trying to convert him into. He's from his world. He's Muslim. He's a lover of the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and his work is kind of... <coughs> a kind of exuberant uh, froth on the sea of, 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 of the Qur'anic revelation in a certain way. It's, it's deeply Qur'anically linked, and that's one reason for its, for its power. So what does this mean for us briefly? Well, what it might mean, possibly, here's a thought I conclude with to friends near and far, is that in a time when it's hard to find the sheikh of our desires with the kindly uh, eyes and the snowy white beard and the mystical pronouncements who just sprinkles fairy dust over us and turns us into saints of Allah and not available. After all, we're not living in Qunya when there were saints on every street corner. We're living in Mammon, the age of stuff. Humanity completely hypnotized by stuff and even forgetting that they're going to die. That, that's all the thing is nowadays. Where do you find such men, such an elixir? Well. Maybe there is something in this, maybe in a true friendship. The sheikh may not be that. That may not be your fault, so don't despair. Allah is generous. Allah's generosity is not limited to any particular form. If you can't find it in that traditional form, uh, don't worry. Maybe there will be a friend, a lover, a partner, some kind of extraordinary significant other who will be able to put their hand on your soul and suddenly the poetry emerges and the fireworks begin and you become a hand-clapping lover. Shemps and Rumi are proof of the fact that you don't need this formal tariqa structure in every case in order to become somebody who is clearly one of the great arifan, one of the great knowers. as, as Jalal ad-Din Rumi was. Okay, there's a Qadri lineage there. The Mablavia come out of that and tariqas go on to this day inshallah but that's the kind of form, formal outward structure of the mavlaviya with the music and all of the stuff that came after Rumi died but the reality is the poetry and the extraordinary ecstasy and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which Allah can give to people through any moment or any dream or any encounter or any friendship or any love and we should not underestimate Allah's capacity to snatch any one of us out of our dirty dreams and take us into a land of purity, insha'Allah. Anyway, so the point of this lecture has been just to set the scene, and it's magnificent. Qunya 
in the 13th century is a land of saints and scholars and fuqaha, and it's an amazing place. And inshallah, as we spend time here, we'll make dua for them and hope for the barakah of the land that was perfumed by them, and inshallah, have the, the um, possibility of visiting the places where they rest, the places where they taught, and really to have respect for this place. This is one of the capitals of our civilization. May Allah, inshallah, open to us some of the doors that he opened to them. Barakallahu feekum, wal afu minkum, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Morghe baghe malakutam Morghe baghe malakutam Neyem az alam khak دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت آن بدنم